feeling in here just a little bit here. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty. If you want to move up a seat, Tiffany, is this a bad idea? Is it a bad idea for people to move up? Never mind, stay there. Because they might come in and we might have an awkward moment there. I'm trying to help you out. I'm simply trying to help you out. Why don't we stand real quick? And I know you've met everyone that's sitting right next to you, but why don't you go a couple seats over, introduce yourself, and give somebody a hug, and uh, then we're going to get going here. All right, go ahead and uh, wrap that up. Go ahead and grab a seat. All right, go ahead and grab a seat, everyone. All right, who's ready for this afternoon? Obviously you are. I want to tell you, I think the true heroes of any event or conference are the ones that come to the afternoon sessions. So that is literally all you guys, and uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, let me set a little bit of a context of what we're going to do this afternoon. How many were here uh, this morning when Gabe interviewed my dad and Chris? Pretty much everybody good. As we were leading up and planning the, this uh, leaders event, there was kind of a theme that we definitely wanted to hit, and that was around the idea of how uh, multi-generations, emerging leaders, young and old, and everyone in between, and the whole idea of building an environment, building environment where that's happened, that's happening. And so one of the reasons why we interviewed my dad and Chris this morning around, around that idea was a lot of the stuff that we experience here is there's values that drive the culture, there's practical things that we do to drive the culture. And so as we were planning this whole event out, one of the things that we wanted to do in the afternoon was to create some space for some of our emerging leaders, our emerging voices of people that are leading in our environment. Some of them are leading massive parts of our environment, some of them are leading departments, and they're just, they're carrying the culture, and they are, in our language, second generation culture carriers. And um, we are definitely on this, we definitely have the strong bent to see what God is doing in this house to continue through the generations, as Danny was sharing this morning. And so this event definitely had a strong theme on that. And so uh, we have two speakers, and they're about 35 minutes each, but we wanted to put them in front of you. So I'm going to introduce the first one. But what I want you to do is I want you, even though this is the afternoon session, I want this to be the most passionate, excited explosive session from you guys the entire time, okay? I'm convinced if you come to an afternoon session, you really want to be here. So that's what we're here for. And, um, but we want to bring up somebody, don't come up yet. His name is Chris Cruz. And how many have never, how many have never heard of Chris Cruz in person before? So a lot of you, so a few of you have heard of him. Chris Cruz is one of our dear sons of the house that is becoming a father in the house. And I was leading second year. This was years ago now. And there is there's this crazy Puerto Rican kid, literally, kid in our second year, um, second year school of ministry that was literally leaking passion everywhere he went. And I remember saying when he came to second year, he said, I need to hire him directly out of second year and make him a revival group pastor at the age of 22 years old. And his entire revival group is older than him. So we didn't introduce him to the shallow end. We just threw him in the deep end and said, you're going to figure this thing out. And so Chris was, it went through our school of ministry. I uh, was in a uh, revival group pastor for about six years, 
six or seven years, and now he is our young adult pastor for Bethel Church. And so I want you to listen to him and receive from him as you receive from any of the other fathers in the house, because he is one of our great sons that's becoming a father. He's a dear friend, and I'm so proud of this guy right here. So why don't you put your hands together and welcome Chris Cruz. Thank you. I'm going to hold it together. Well, hi, I'm Chris. <laughs> Whew. Just had to get that out of the way for a second. <clears throat> That's going to happen periodically, so you're going to have to uh, excuse me on that note. Spent a little bit of time before this just praying and just, yeah, I'm feeling good. <laughs> well, yeah, my name's Chris. I'm originally from New Jersey. Uh, yeah, wow. Are you guys actually from New Jersey? Where are you from? Where in South Jersey? Okay, cool. I'm from Trenton. And so I'm from the place where real pizza's from, uh, where, where you have things called pork roll sandwiches. Uh, there's a few. That's awesome. Um, thank God. Um, but yeah, so I'm from New Jersey originally. Um, uh, I have been married for seven years to that beautiful woman down at the end, Lana. That's my wife over there. Seven years. We have a, like, my wife is the testimony that God does not treat you according to you de- the way that you deserve to be treated. I have married up and my wife is extraordinary. I am not, uh, whew, Yes. Um, we have an amazing son that's um, just a little tank. His name is Solomon. He's a year, just over a year and a half, and he is full of life and energy. I didn't know something so small could hand me my rear end. I did not know. I was the first night home. I was like, what did we do? Um, but we, he's just the cutest thing. He wakes up in the morning, and when we go and open the door, the first thing he says is, Hi! Just so much life and energy, and it's, oh my gosh, it is so much joy having him. And so I've, uh, I've been at Bethel for 10 years. Um, my family has been shaped by this house. I've been shaped by this house. My five out of the six fam- family members have been baptized up there in radical fashion, um, in extraordinary ways. And I'm um, I'm the young adults pastor here, as Eric mentioned. I thought I'd tell you guys a fun story about something that happened with one of our young adults. Is that cool? Cool. I was going to tell it anyway. <laughs> when, uh, this is what she emailed me. She said, when I was five, I fell off a swing and slammed my jaw onto our porch. I never experienced problems after that until my freshman year of high school. I was cast in, as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz at my performing arts school. I woke up for our last performance unable to open my jaw more than half an inch. I had multiple chiropractors and therapists take a look that morning to see if there was anything to be done. They couldn't relax my jaw enough to get it back into its socket. I completed my last performance thanks to a lot of pain meds and prayer. Two weeks later, I went to a specialist who gave me a very large and painful injection into my jaw joint. Once numb, they cracked my jaw back into place and made a jaw splint that I had to wear 24-7 to keep my jaw from locking up again. I was prescribed Vicodin, and I had to stay on liquid diet, uh, a liquid diet for the first few weeks. They said, they said all this was because when I fell when I was young, I had to ac- actually permanently deform my jawbone that caused my jaw uh, joint to shift out of place. And because it was left untreated for so many years, the one side of my jaw wore away all the way, all the tissue and much of the bone in that joint. After months of that therapy that she went through, seeing a different chiropractor in a different place, they did x-rays, tested her again, and uh, it didn't seem to help. They transferred again to a different specialist. After more x-rays and electronic treatments, I had another jaw splint made and a couple appointments every month for shock treatment. This lasted a year and a half. The doctor told me I would have to wear a jaw splint every night for the rest of my life, otherwise my jaw would lock up again and continue to wear away the bone. 
I went to the healing rooms, received prayer from anyone willing to pray over me, and nothing had changed. Six years went by wearing a, a splint to bed, taking multiple pain medications every day, and sometimes not even talking, singing, or even smiling because of pain. But it was, now it's been a full month of no pain, and no splint, and no fear. I'm very, she said, I'm not a very outwardly emotional person, but the Tuesday night when you called out jaw healing, I completely lost it and slumped to the floor, bawling my eyes out. I believe the vulnerability and the complete total surrender I showed during that moment was something the Lord was waiting for from me. I was always an independent person, so trusting God uh, would, would heal me was really difficult. But in that moment, I felt peace, and I surrendered it all to the Lord and gave up the need to control. I went home after Tribe, which is our young adult ministry, it's called Tribe. I went home after Tribe, shut my splint away in a, a cabinet, fully trusting the Lord would heal me. I woke up the next morning, slowly opening my mouth, felt a pop and absolutely no pain. And she writes, I mean, what? Absolutely insane. I have felt no pain in my jaw since, and it's been a month for her since that. It's pretty awesome. In a moment, a tribe. So that's, we meet on Tuesday nights, and they're just a rowdy bunch that I love getting to run with. They're so much fun. But I am absolutely thrilled and humbled to talk with you guys and share what might be helpful from my life or anything that I experienced. So I feel way in over my head again. So it feels like it's a little bit of life for me right now. Um, but uh, before we get into this, what I wanna talk to you about, in 2005, I had a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed everything about me. And then in 2007, um, I got rescued from how I saw God. And so this, uh, yeah, you heard that correctly. I got rescued from how I saw God. And I, um, in that time period, it affected everything when I learned this thing about God that I realized I didn't know or how I saw him in a certain way. It changed everything. It's like the phrase where it says that Jesus fills every valley, makes every mountain low, every crooked road is made straight, and every, every rough way is made smooth. It's like nothing was left untouched by this when I heard it and experienced it. But before we get into it, it changed every, like I'm talking, it changes everything. My leadership, my family life, how I do it, it's changed all of it. But before we get started, I wanted to do a little bit of framing and get you guys to see where we're going for those of you that need a little bit of direction because it's gonna help us stay on time. <laughs> Can I get that slide that goes back there? I'm doing a little bit of Danny Silk. If they still, if they have it, I don't know. Yeah, they got it, there it is. All right, so I'm gonna talk about made and making, mood swings, Paris and the icon of God, Hebrews 1, all in on Christ, Father, wounded God, no threats, a story we all know. I'm gonna do that in 27 minutes. Listen, we preach to young adults in 30 minutes, so we got this. Um, okay, made and making. We all orbit around our image of God. We, the, our image of God is the fountainhead of our spirituality. Um, this means that we, as being made in the image and likeness of God, it means two things. It means one, that we have a unchangeable quality about us because we are human. Just simple fact, we are made in the image and likeness of God. This is why we treat every person with dignity and respect. And that is because we're made in the image and likeness of God as humans. Then there is a second thing about being made in the image and likeness of God is that we are moldable to our image and likeness of God. Meaning that this is why it's so important we have a clear image of God because how we see him is how we will be. We orbit around our image of God. And when, when this is why God says idols are dangerous, not because he's threatened by them. He says idols are dangerous because we will never be who we are meant to be with them. So here's the thing. If we heal our image of God, watch how it heals us. Even in the garden, the reason they made a poor choice was because their image of God got distorted, got changed. And then when they changed their image of God, they acted in ways that were inconsistent with who they were. We all get the right beliefs, but before you get the right beliefs, you need the right image. Okay. Let me, and I'll tell you something, they, they, when, 
when they had that, when Adam and Eve had that moment in the garden where they transitioned from trusting who God was, when the intentions of him, of God were doubted by the serpent, they acted in a way that was inconsistent with who they are and inconsistent with how they saw God. And when they did that, they acted poorly. And then all of a sudden they started to have the wrong fear of God. And we all have this God-shaped vacuum inside of us that is because we are made in the image of God. So the way we see God is how we will be made inside. So when we have this vacuum that pulls in these things, if we don't have clarity, what we start to do is create an illusion and a myth around God. And I know a lot of atheists who I am with them in the atheist camp of the God that they think is God because of the way that they experienced all of life and the vacuum of that started to create this image of God that was inconsistent. And I had it myself. This is where for me, oh, I thought that was gonna stay up there, but it's not. Um, it's back. Okay, let's just keep it there. That way it helps me. Mood swings. Um, the reason why I, I, this thing started to happen instead of me, my story was this, is that I started to believe that my grades, my life, the blessings coming my way, all the different things that were happening were dependent on God's behavior or, well, attitude that morning, which was then determined by whether I had looked at porn the night before. And so if what would happen, what, it would be this cycle that's, that um, if I had looked at pornography, then all of a sudden that morning I could anticipate bad things happening to me because God wanted me to know that that was wrong. Therefore, let this bad thing happen to him and then he'll correct it. But what it did was send me more into darkness and sin because I was already dissatisfied and thought God was dissatisfied with me. So I said, what the heck, why not do more? And so this idea of the mood swings of heaven made me live so inconsistent, so swayed back and forth. I started to anticipate his vengeance before I anticipated mercy. He looked like Zeus more than he looked like anything else. He was throwing lightning bolts when I had poor behavior and I felt like all of my life was trying to figure out how to I soothe his conscience about me. How do I change the way he thinks about me because heaven is having these mood swings. God feels so bipolar to me. I don't know if you've ever been there. Worship felt like a confession booth that would try to keep God at bay. I loved him, but I feared him in a way that was like, hey, I just got to check off my list. So what I'm going to do? Repent for 18 different things. Because I know that if I repent sometime, then you'll be okay. So I needed... Clarity, I craved clarity. I don't know if you've ever felt that because there's, there's something I needed. I needed something to part the clouds of confusion surrounding the nature of God. I wanted to know what is he like? What is he like? I needed the mood swings to stop. I needed to find an anchor. I needed something to fill the vacuum. I needed something that was clear and true. Now, in 2015, my wife and I got to go to Paris, which was a dream trip, and um, it was the trip where my son, um, we'll leave it there. So we, had, we said we wanna to go to Paris before we have a kid, and so we went to Paris, and when we went to Paris, we went to the Louvre Museum, the world-renowned Louvre Museum that hosts and holds the famous, but way smaller than you think, Mona Lisa. <laughs> like, when you get there, you're like, that's it. And then all these people are taking pictures of it. You're like, Google's got a better picture than you're going to take right now. And it's way smaller. I'm like, it's so small. But what didn't just like, what didn't, what, that's not what marked me about when we went to the Louvre Museum. When we went to the Louvre Museum, we walked in. And when I walked in across this entryway is this phrase written in French. And it's, uh, it's credited to the Apostle Paul. And the address is Colossians 1.15. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh my gosh, this feels like a treat. Because now I realized we were about to go into what was a sacred art exhibit on the image of God. And so it was about the church painting Jesus. And as you walk into this exhibit, you walk in and when you turn the corner, the first painting that greets you is the face of Jesus. And it's one of those paintings that when you look at it, it reads you more than you read the painting. 
And you just stare at it and feel like the eyes are just right looking right into the core of you. Well, this painting was there. And then what I looked at was the description of the exhibit. And the exhibit was talking about how in this time, in this, in this time of history, there was a, uh, a fight in the church. Feels like you could point that at any point. Fight in the church. But they were fighting about being able to paint Jesus. The, the, church, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church were fighting about whether they could paint Jesus. And this is how they got the confidence to paint Jesus. This is the statement that was made at the council. This is what they said. God can be depicted because he became a man making himself visible in the person of Christ. God can be depicted because he became a man making himself visible visible in the person of Christ. Colossians 1.15 is that he is the image of the invisible God, and that word image is icon. And that what in the, in the ancient way of art form where they would do theology with lines and paint, it would be that, they, that God made himself flesh and bone, that he was the icon of God, making what is invisible visible. You see, the image of the invisible God, when I read that quote from that book. What, it was like that moment in Ratatouille when he eats the food and all of a sudden he's dancing and colors are bursting and all this kind of stuff is happening. It's because I remembered in that moment what I had heard in 2007 for the very first time and it just brought me down is this phrase right now. You probably have heard it, but you need to hear it every day is that Jesus is perfect theology. Colossians 1.15, if they were listening to this when it was spoken to them, because it was a letter passed and read publicly, or they were there when Paul was in prison writing it, they would have heard, he's the image of the invisible God, which would have meant this, that every thought I have about God is now accountable to Jesus. Every thought I have about God is accountable to Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of God that tolerates no rival. Hebrews 1, check it out. You guys are already there because you use an app. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Hebrews 1 says this. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe. What he's saying is in the Old Testament, in the law and the prophets, we got rough sketches advanced sketches of God. And then in Jesus, we get God's self-portrait. You see, Jesus presses the delete button on all the wrong images we have of God because he is the anchor in which we now hold to on when we wonder, what is he like? He ends the mood swings of heaven. He kills the bipolar concept of God. He is the flawless revelation of God is what he's saying here. He is Jesus is two things for me. This is why I got him tattooed on me. Um, two, first thing, when, well, in icons, whenever you see Jesus with two fingers, it means fully God, fully man. If you're ever wondering why he always two fingers up, fully God, fully man. That's why in icon paintings of Jesus, that's what that means. He's not just going peace. He's going fully God, <laughs> fully man. Jesus is God's dream come true, the true face of every human. And he is the true face of God. He is not a word of God. He is the word of God. He is not the nice side of God. Colossians says the fullness of deity dwelled in him in bodily form, not an aspect. The exact imprint, what that would mean is if I had a signet ring, if I had a signet ring, it would be this. It was that, that signet ring pressed into wax. And when you pulled out the wax, pulled the ring out of the wax, that imprint would be the exact imprint. That's why when Jesus says, whose face is on that coin and whose likeness is the coin, when I talked to him about Caesar and taxes, he's using the reference there going, what is imprinted on there that exactly like that? That is what I am of the Father. 
Mm. The Old Testament is accurate to which it serves its accurate purpose. It is accurate in which it serves its accurate purpose. Hebrews tells us that if it was faultless, we wouldn't have needed something, but meaning this, that this is what it means. It says this, it's that it is a womb. And if you think the womb is the baby, you mess it up. And so what I don't do is over, overturn what God revealed in Christ with the law and the prophets. I cannot reverse what God has made known in Christ. I don't know if any of you wake up in the middle of the night and have to pee, but it happens. And when you're single, you don't have to turn the light, you can turn the lights on and you're fine. But when you're married, you can't turn the lights on. But it's, 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 it's weird. But you, when you walk at night, you realize when you forgot something was placed where it shouldn't be or something was there that you forgot was there. Because you step on it, you hit it, you nail it, you don't know, oh gosh, you, you hit your shins, your toes, whatever it may be. If you got kids, you got toys on the floor, whatever it may be. But how do you navigate a dark room? You navigate the dark room by what it was like when the lights were on. So when you have these concepts going, I have these questions about God's character, God's nature that I'm reading when I'm reading through the Old Testament. Hebrews says, God spoke in various ways through the prophets, but guess what? You put the anchor in his son. You walk through the dark room that you don't understand by knowing what is this room like when the lights are on? What is this room like when I know God in Christ? Paul says, Paul says that even the veil is removed when they turn to the Lord in reading Moses. It says you cannot properly read Moses without knowing Jesus. Paul says that it's removed and that the light that shone lights as, as shines in our hearts that we would have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. He says, I came to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. Paul was ready to pull the full weight of his ministry on the revelation of God in Christ. Knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. Paul didn't get a book on grace that he got at the best bookstore. Paul didn't go down the road and go, what's the best book on grace that I can find? In Galatians, Paul tells us, no one taught me this. It came at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, actually, put the hope. Put your hope in the grace that will come to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But Paul isn't afraid to put the full weight behind this idea that God is known best in Christ. I, God said to me one day, he said to me, Chris, you're believing a lie about me again. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, you, you believe that people don't want me. He says, people, you believe that people don't want to talk to Christians. And I was like, well, I think I actually do believe that lie, yeah. He go, and he said, he said, he said, he said um, I'm the desire of the nations. Everyone really wants me. And so I said, you're right, you're right, you are the desire of the nation. So I went outside, started, went to go pray for some people. And when I went to go pray for some people, the first person I went into, I said, how's your day? They said, good. I said, what would make it better? They said, an encounter with God. So what does, if Jesus is the full revelation of God, not the side of God, not an aspect of God, not the nice side of God, but the definitive revelation of God, what does he reveal about God? And one thing that is so, so, so incredible is Jesus says, the Father and I are one. We find that he reveals that God is a father. He's not the unmoved mover. He's not this stoic, like, just philosophical phrasing. No, he's a father. Jesus actually tells us in John 17 that before God created the world, he was loving the Son. John 17, 24, look it up. He says, before you love me before the creation of the world, before God decided to do any kind of creative act, he was loving the son. God 
Jesus reveals that God is a father. Let me tell you another story that's kind of just, I couldn't believe it when I watched the video because I didn't anticipate a lingerie company to tell the gospel. I watched this video. My mom said, hey, you need to see this video. Uh, a laundry company in Thailand wanted to show the beauty of women internally, not just externally. So they did a series of videos to try to show this. And then they're, they're true stories and they, they filmed this video. And this video, go, this one video that I watched goes like this, where you see this mother who is in school running to try to find her kid and pick her up because she's showing up late. And she's trying to figure out, oh man, how do I, oh, I gotta get my child. And you see her running and trying to do all these things to get it. And you see the remarks made about her because they say, you know, she had this baby through her sugar daddy or she had this baby through these different kinds of things. And, and she eventually is, run, is just stretched in time and she meets this artist and says, hey, will you teach my child art? And he says, yes, I could teach your child art. And so over time, he eventually asks her, what's the true story about your daughter? And she says, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not necessary. He says, no, what's the true story about your daughter? And then you see the film starts to show you the true story of her daughter. You find her, this woman, she's at a garbage dump and she throws her garbage in the garbage and all of a sudden she hears a baby cry. And she looks in and she sees this child that's been abandoned. And she takes this child home with her. And she says to the man, I'd rather them speak evil of me and speak evil of her. You see, the cross is God willing to be misunderstood so that he might heal his children. The, so in this, we see a God who says, by my wounds, you are healed. He's a God that says, I actually will put my reputation on the line. I will not protect my reputation over loving you. I will not protect my reputation as God over rescuing you. And on the cross, God does not look like the way they want God to look. You see, one of the early church fathers says this, what is not assumed in Christ, meaning what is not taken on by Christ is not healed. What is not taken on by Christ is not healed. So what does Jesus have to do? He has to take on human flesh to heal man. But what does he also have to do? He has to take on the wrong images of God so that he might heal the wrong images of God. So that he can heal and set man free because if he sets man free from their image of God, then they change. God becomes misunderstood in Christ to heal our misunderstandings of God. Okay, got eight minutes left. You guys doing okay? Okay. Oh, Jesus. I love it. By his wounds, we are healed. We have a God who says, I'll heal you, but it's going to be by my wounds, not yours. The temptation of the Pharisees was to not make Jesus God. The temptation of today is to not make Jesus fully God. The temptation of the Pharisees was to go, Jesus isn't God. The temptation for our hour is to go, Jesus is an aspect of God. He's the nice side. Not to make him the full revelation of God. To go, no, this is exactly what he was like. December 31st, 2007, I asked God, if it is your will to heal, you've got to show it to me. When the lepers come to Jesus and Jesus says, it is my will. I am willing. My intentions cleared right there. The definitive revelation of God states, it is my will to heal. You see, even on the cross, Jesus, man is doing their worst. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Kill Bill, but if you're not, if, you probably shouldn't see it. <laughs> probably shouldn't see it. I saw it before I got saved. You heard about it. I heard about it. I read a synopsis online. It's about a, about a woman who is, who is killed and left for dead and then comes back to get all the people that killed her. You see, on the cross, man does their worst. They crucify God. And in that moment, Jesus is saying to those that are oppressing him, you will not make me an oppressor. Oh, Jesus is saying, you will not make me an oppressor. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You can't make God an enemy by being an enemy to God. 
You can't on the cross. He leaves them who are crushing him saying, there is a road back for you. There is no threats you're left with. No, I'm coming for your family. No, I'm coming for your friends. No, hey, you who are crushing me right now, there is a way back for you. Forgiveness was the retaliation at the cross. And one last story, a story we all know. You see, all of these things, when I heard Jesus is perfect theology, this is what I've spent the last 10 years of my life just feeling like I need to undo and unpack with God in my own times, just reading and looking at all of this going, Jesus, oh my gosh, you're much more beautiful than I even imagined. Oh my gosh, look at this story, how it displays you. And look at how this story shows how you speak of who God really is and what he is like. And we, there's a story we all know, and it's in John 8. It's when Jesus is brought has, has been brought this woman who has been caught in the act. Caught in the act. And they bring her before Jesus to test Jesus. And Jesus does something so interesting, which I don't hear people say often, is that he actually gives them permission to kill her. He says, yeah, okay, we're gonna do it. Let's do it. Okay, who's without sin? You can throw the first stone. And so one by one, they start to leave, not realizing Jesus is the only one standing there who is without sin. He's saying to them, I am the only one who has permission to kill her. And then they start leaving. And then she, he says to her, where are your condemners? And she says, he goes, neither do I condemn you. See, God doesn't throw stones. I no longer anticipated God's punishment the next morning in the form of bad grades, somebody getting sick or somebody getting hurt, somebody in my family having this problem happen to them. I no longer anticipated a dissatisfied God. I found out that God in Christ is convinced about me unto death. Convinced about me unto death, not tolerating me, enjoying me. And in this moment, we see <laughs> that her future holiness, because he says to her, go and sin no more. Her future holiness, because if God says something, he's not puffing it up. It's not hype. He says, go and sin no more. Her future holiness came at the revelation that God does not condemn her. I have been kept pure from pornography for over 10 years, not at the idea that God is waiting with some kind of punishment, but that God is so in love with me. And then being living in that revelation of God in Christ sets me free and allows me to get rid of the points game. Allows me to get rid of the facade because God, got, uh, guys, oh my gosh, God doesn't heal our egos. He doesn't heal our egos. He doesn't heal our facades. He doesn't go, let me kind of paint the mask a different color. And when we find out God is like Christ, we're safe to go and say, come meet the man who told me everything I've done. When we find out God is like Christ, we have the most natural response is to have vulnerability. We, we I, I shared this with our young adults and at the ministry time, this group came forward, about four of them. They had came in a tribe, it was their first time. They'd ever come in, they heard about us and, and they're not, they had not known Jesus. And, and one of the ministry team members says, what's your image of God? And they go, nothing like that. I grew up with a God of stones. A God of stones, throwing stones. I grew up a God that was, that was what he was like. And I didn't want anything to do with that, but I want everything to do with that God. And all four of them got saved that night. I remember a moment in my life where I was sitting on the couch in, in a living room with family members all around me, aunts, uncles, cousins, mom, dad, everybody. And they're watching this Jensen Franklin video and it's about to end and I feel this beat in my chest that is telling me, you've got to tell them everything you've done. And I'm like, my parents are here. My cousins are here. My brothers are here. What are they gonna do when they know all the stuff about me? 
So this video ends, and it was like something pushed me out of my chair. And I popped out and said, I got to tell you something. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I was like, I looked at him all, and I said, I did drugs this day when I went and did here. I did this. I was looking at pornography on this day. Went out, and I just started just unloading everything that came into my brain. I let it all go. And then it came to the moment where it ended. And I was like, oh, my parents, what's it going to be like when they, when they come and talk to me now? And my parents come walking down towards me. And I'm like, okay, golden child, no more. <laughs> they know everything now. They walk up to me and my mom and my dad look at me, tears in their eyes. My mom says, I am so proud of you. No threat. No, this is coming down on you. No, oh, what have you done? No, they showed me God in Christ does not throw stones. Jesus is perfect theology. He is the definitive revelation of God. And if we anchor ourselves in this, it changes everything about how we lead, how we father, how we're friends, how we're part of a community, all of it. Because when you heal our image of God, you heal us. So let me pray for you. Father, in you, we live, we move, and we have our being. You guide us and you govern us by your Holy Spirit. So right now I ask that every faulty image of God would come down. Every false idol of you would be removed in us. As we hold every thought accountable to the image of God in Jesus. That we would be anchored and listening to him. In Jesus' name. Help us to live in this, God. To let go of our egos, to get past our facades, to not need to protect our reputation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.